Hello, my name is Alex Marsh. I'm the director and creator of the ODST Machinima, and let's just take a let's just take a gander through the making of it. Now, my inspirations for this was uh, clearly the uh, Red vs. Blue uh, series with its, all its Halo Machinima and type stuff. I've been watching that stuff for years and I got onto the bandwagon of the Halo Reach Machinimas when they came out which is a lot of like World War II D-Day re reenactments using uh, elites and Spartans and I always wanted to try to do something like that. Um, I never had the technical know-how on how to make all this stuff. It was, it was never like a single guide on how to make a machinima. I think it's only after I got, uh, when I started doing my BA at university and being taught how to script write and how to break things down and shoot them is when I slowly began my first forays into uh, doing machinima type filmmaking. In fact, one of my second year final films was uh, a machinima in ODST uh, called Someone to Watch Over Me. Uh, it got me a pretty good grade, so I'm glad I'm happy with how that turned out. And I think from that, my exploration into machinimas kind of got further, and seeing how other people make theirs, uh, I kind of got me clocked on on how to do that as well. The first challenge was actually trying to find people who wanted to help because not not because of the technical challenges that presented but because it was quite a hard pitch to sell because it's basically uh, help me with this film that requires no cameras uh, no boom mics or anything just a, a, a guy a writing a guy with the typewriter and the computer that can play Halo one of the hardest parts of the machinima was writing it. Uh, a lot of a lot of machinimas out there are just one and done stories, which is okay. I think Red vs Blue and a series called Avalanche are probably the only uh, two series I know of asterisk that used long form uh, storytelling in series. Uh, Red vs Blue is kind of unique because it started off as a sketch uh, sketch comedy, I'd say and then developed into a story-based series. So my real writing process was, uh, I wrote the first episode and the last episode together, and then every other episode in between was basically trying to connect one episode one to the last episode. Uh, it, ended up, it ended up me changing a lot of stuff for, but for the beginning and end of the series. But I, it's got. I've got. I think I spent about five months overall making, writing the scripts, reading them over, and then doing little edits to them. Um, and then uh, we, uh, production was halted. Uh, why? University. Um, I, there was a, there was a year gap between the initial ten scripts and actually starting production of it. I hired Anime Alchemist, a voice actor, uh, to voice Ashel in the teaser trailer which was released about a year and a bit ago now. As, to, as a kind of proof of, proof, proof of concept. Um, of course when that trailer was released then there was the year gap which I which oh, I say year, about a few, about eight, nine months gap which uh, I was just basically doing my master's film. That was also right, right, rewriting and re-double checking the scripts, which as it turns out, you write your scripts and then leave them for a year, come back and look at them and you go, Ugh. I'd always wanted to do an ODST uh, machinery or at least an ODST fan film of some sort. Turns out, quite expensive to make a uh, live action film featuring soldiers from the future. I think I priced it up 
uh, for, a, for a fan film with two OUSD characters to be about upwards of £10,000 because that's buying the armour or three, buying materials to get it 3D replicated, painting it, weathering it, actors, cameras and everything. And so the logical step was to go straight to Machinima because it's cheaper. <laughs> it literally requires your computer or Xbox, a controller and a hardware that can um, that can record that gameplay. The 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 difficulty of making a machinima, however, cannot be understated due to the fact that the tools given to you in theatre mode on Halo is quite limited. It is, I mean, it consists of a single camera, which eliminates multi-camera setups. You can fake it using uh, the same recording from shot from different angles, but the problem is that if you don't get it first time, it is very difficult to get it the second time. Which may sound weird because uh, you can theatre mode allows you to loop back recording, so you can continuously rewatch it. But it, it's more of the time of essence. If if it doesn't look right from one angle, then it won't look right from another. So that one chance of getting the shot usually makes it or break it. A lot of episodes one uh, shots are tracking. Uh, I would, not only as a test to see if I could do it, but to uh, get some interesting shots because a lot of machinimas, and for good reason, uh, shoot from a stationary point and then pan around to follow the, um, follow the character. Uh, problem with tracking and moving the camera is that it looks a bit unnatural with the motion blur inherent in the uh, early in the Bungie era games means that sometimes it doesn't look right when you pan or track with the character. Uh, so that was one of the hardest issues. The way I got around it sometimes is by shooting it in three different techniques. Uh, one from POV shot, so that's looking from the character's point of view, of course POV, but that comes with its own issues, such as the ammo counter, which is very hard to replicate um, or have continuity with because of how the games work with picking up ammo. Um, especially in what I did it, I did it two ways. I I played the game through once, normally with no skulls on, um, on easy modes to get through the level as it was, um, so I could have the ammo counter if I wanted to use it, and then once again with a skull on which gives you unlimited ammo. And so I could play that on hard difficulty and get that gritty action shots without running out of ammo for the main weapon because each character has their own weapon uh, to identify them with so it would be a bit weird if Ash on the first episode ran out of her primary weapon and then just dumped it for a weapon that could be mistaken for another character it was it was a lot of process for the POV shots so that's why uh, you don't often see the POV in the first episode it, it, because of the ammo counter, but also because of the objective signs and the little red reticle you get when you get injured. It's also annoying for continuity issues because the red reticle, if it's there when you're injured, it's also there when you do an over the shoulder shot, which is a bit difficult as well. Um, just because anything that affects the player affects the first and third person camera and it's it's difficult when you have to do that because I've tried to get around it by colour grading it by removing the red but it does look a bit janky in some shots. The second way is stationary so that's what I said before it's staying there and moving the camera with the character uh, panning with the character around the scene which comes with its own problems because 
because there's a lot of obstacles in the way. Uh, Bungie are great at designing levels, uh, to my annoyance, because there's a lot of cover objects you can go behind, and that means that if it's if, if your camera is tracking them from one angle and gets blocked off by there, you ha then have to either pause it, go to that next location, look down, and follow them from a different angle, which is hard because it's very difficult to follow a 180 degree wall, 180 the 180 degree rule, which states if you look at a, ca a character from one side, you have to cut to the other side without breaking it. I'm sure I did a terrible job explaining that. Uh, so stationary works if you know where the character is going to be at any one time, and the problem is with that is that it's very easy to forget where your character is when making a machinima, which is why there's some panicked, uh, panicked flip-flops between the camera trying to find the character, which may sound bizarre because I'm the one who played the game, but it's very, it is, it's very annoying when I have to shoot my own stuff because I know I like to jump about and kill enemies in a very impressive way that looks great in POV or you know, camera shots, but not when it's like a stationary tracking one. Uh, the other way I got around this is by uh, faking police cameras that were there. So when it's like looking through Virgil's point of view, the superintendent looking down, following the character from like high rise locations. Uh, that came with its own problems, but that's the primary way of getting around it. Lastly, there's uh, moving the camera with the character, which, as I said, comes with, came with its very unique problem of motion blur, which make just kind of like which, which when the characters move themselves, they have a motion blur, but when you move the camera alongside, it kind of like doubles it or makes it look a bit weird. Um, I, there's also the fact that the camera itself is a physical object within the theater mode, so if it gets stuck on something, it gets you know it kind of bumps itself out of the way, which makes it look a bit janky sometimes, and frankly that that's just annoying. Um, there's also the fact that there's no good way of moving a camera within a combat space with loads of NPCs running about, because you're always bound to get stuck on something. Uh, this is probably the least used method in the first episode, mainly because... It, I, I, there was a second draft where it was mostly tracking shots and I watched it and it looked terrible which is why there's quite a lot of stationary and um, stationary like security camera shots in the final product just because um, I, I didn't, don't think if, if I think from a cinematography point of view if it was all moving camera shots like I had in the second edit then I don't think it would have been as good as it was, or as good as it could be, I should say. And then, yeah, uh, that's why there's not a lot of moving cameras. So the next step was in fact hiring voice actors for the Mishima. Uh, so I'd actually uh, made the large, the large portion of the machinima had been made beforehand, and I had gone to searching out voice actors for all the characters because it, it, I wanted to make sure that I didn't have to search for them later. Uh, <laughs> so if I did it all at once, I could know who and what I could do um, with that, with all their voice lines. So I managed to get. Uh, an alchemist back to voice Ashel. Uh, really chuffed about that. I think great voice actress. Uh, along with all these people on the screen, I think they've done a perfect job. Even if they haven't had many voice lines in the episode, they will do in the future. Uh, I got them to voice a firefight script and the episode script. So the firefight script is basically all the little. Uh, combat dialogue to be saying so like reloading and I am hurt and engineer down 
uh, just not only so I could use that later on if they're in like a fight or something but also just to sp spice up some of the dialogue uh, light scenes so that's like if they're in combat uh, Ashel has a lot of these lines in the first episode and that's Firefight from the Firefight script um, it's also to get me get get me wise on the how to uh, properly modulate their voice to sound like they're in helmets, uh, which I tried I tried my best with the teaser trailer to try and get Ashel's voice to sound like it was inside the helmet. It didn't sound too great to me, but that's probably my perfectionism uh, getting the better of me. <laughs> I think overall there's about 30 minutes of uh, dialogue recorded for the first episode. That, that, that's from all the actors, including their firefight scripts, or near about half an hour, um, which is is uh, it was, it was amazing. To, which is always an amazing feeling because it was just like staring at a folder full of voice clips and things and stirring it and just looking at the episode fully edited and going that was me I, 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 I that it, it, it was just amazing to see all this stuff from so many people for one thing which make which makes me sound weird because I haven't even finished the episode yet but it's just seeing all that stuff for one episode and seeing how many people are uh, on board to you know voice stuff make stuff for it and just look at it to see if it was okay. So, overall, uh, the episode took about, if we're going to be pedantic, it took about a year and five months to uh, produce and finally make and upload. Uh, but it realistically, I think it took about s six months, six ish months from filming, getting all the voice lines together and then constructing it fully. Uh, the timeline for this is absolutely horrific. Uh, I, I like I like to think of myself as a pretty decent editor and I looked at it and it was uh, it was probably the, mo the third most densest project I've ever had to edit before. Um, and I've edited some very dense stuff. What I mean by that is the amount of audio and video tracks for it. Uh, I had three tracks, three video tracks solely with all the POV and POV tracking and stationary shots lined up so I could switch between them and see which ones I liked. There was several for graphics, uh, overlays, uh, then the sound, the, the soundtrack itself. So I think there's 16 audio tracks dedicated to music, voice lines, ambient sounds, foley, is quite a lot in this. I think a lot of people don't appreciate the fact that there's always going to be more audio tracks than there will be a video just because sound design is quite integral to uh, any project. Uh, I think a good rule of thumb is something my college tutor taught me which was if someone looks at a video with bad quality but hear it with great quality then they won't mind if someone hears it with bad quality but good video then they will get off immediately which basically means uh, as long as the sound is good and crisp or at least decent and you know what you can hear what's going on you know what's going on via the sound alone then I think the video will help complement that I think if the sound was completely scratchy and terrible, I think a lot of people would log off uh, just immediately. I definitely have a few older films with bad sound, and I cannot get on with them. Yeah, so I, I, I and especially after being uh, told off by several of these sound techs um, beforehand in both college and university, sound is important and never underestimate your foley artists or your music composers. So just to get out of the air, uh, I think it's pretty evident that despite the fact I gave a precise date on the uh, airing of it, which was the Saturday before New Year's Eve, um, 
I had actually uploaded it and was ready to put premiere premiere on it. Uh, unfortunately, it got copyright strikes. It was unlisted, uh, so that meant it could go through the uh, copyright system. And I was hoping that the only copyright I would get was from uh, either Martin O'Donnell or Michael Salvatore who helped compose the music for OGST which I had used in that episode. I knew that was going to happen, I was expecting that to happen. Uh, unfortunately it got copyrighted by some uh, by, by some group out of uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, they said that it was a pop song in there there wasn't. Uh, I contested this, and YouTube did uh, respond to it, and they rightfully restored the episode without the copyright strike. The copyright strike itself was actually quite serious because it was um, it stopped the episode from being broadcast in uh, the UK. Uh, the UK, United States, Sweden, and basically the majority of Europe. Uh, ironically, the only place it wasn't, it, w it would have been shown, it would have been Saudi Arabia, which is the same place the company who was copyright, copyright striking me uh, was, you know. So the irony was great. Uh, so just to make sure this didn't happen again, I took it down, I posted about it when it will, it will be up as soon as it can be, and I re edited it to take out that section. Which is a shame because I like I, it was a, it was a very specific section and I don't think kids uh, it, was, it was I think in my personal opinion I, it was probably the best edited part of the episode uh, which is a bit of a humble brag I know but I had to change the music to it and then re-edit it to fit with that so that's a shame but that's the nature of copyright strikes on the YouTube uh, it, it's, it's not an automatic thing there's no bad blood it should, it's more of an issue of I wanted to make sure I could show this uh, because that that was basically six months worth of work down the drain because of something that wasn't in there um, but it got released eventually on the on, on the 7th which, <laughs> which which I had to laugh about because that was a I think it was a Wednesday I think it was a random day I picked out because I thought that's in the middle of the week, that'd be great. And it's only after uh, I, told, I, I told a friend about it, I was like, I'll release it on the Wednesday. And they went, that's a, that's a seven, that's Bungie's lucky number. I was like, that's brilliant. <laughs> So, where are we now? Well, I am currently recording stuff for voice lines, uh, both from uh, Anime Alchemist and myself. I am helping... helping? I am virtually set building using Gary's mod, and here's a little peek of what the next episode is about. I say that as if I actually, actually haven't recorded anything by this date. Um, and it should be out uh, about April-ish. April-ish. There'll be a trailer dropping, uh, when, dropping when it has a concrete uh, premiere date. And hopefully, hopefully this time, it will not be striked out of oblivion. I'm Alex Marsh, and thank you for watching this uh, VDoc. Uh, see, you, see you when we next drop.